All right. So that was quick. Shane, you're back on the show. <laughs> you know, I couldn't stay away. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this is this is this is great fun because there, there's a there's another um, um, uh, was a side quest that I want to go into with you before we get into the, the juicy stuff. Okay. That is you mentioned how um, companies are going to have to find a balance between personalization you know, an AI model reflecting back your own values and biases and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like your, your cultural expectations around what it means to engage with someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is like mannerisms. This is like a whole bunch. Uh, so they're going to have to balance personalization with universality, things that are universally true and things mm -hmm. that are universally acknowledged and things that are universal values. And I think that's like a very interesting thing that uh, you know, there's another is another issue that AI makes us think about. That is, what is the relationship between universal and all the positive and negative connotations of things that are universal, and the things that are personalized, with the positive and negative about that too. Um, what what are your thoughts on that question, and how do you how do you think AI uh, how do you think it plays out, and how do you think it should play out? Christian, I, I love how philosophical you get with some of these. I'm going to be very pragmatic. Uh, <laughs> what do you think of how social media has done it? You know, the TikToks, the YouTubes, the the uh, Twitters, Facebooks, Meta, obviously, like, um, because that's the way I honestly think things may go. That's the closest analogy in for a lot of AI, you know, people you know, have nuclear weapons, other analogies. I think those are terrible analogies for reasons I don't get into. Um, but Social media is a, is a direct sort of uh, blueprint for how personalization might happen. You know, they want to maximize engagement and reflect people's values the way that they want them. Um, the problem is that everybody wants everybody else to have certain more universal principles, but they want to have their own too. And so we get into this problem about, you know, and, you know, the, the policy and society teams at all these big companies, you know, they have like, here are the thing, the principles we don't break, and here are the ones we do. And often the the second part is much bigger than the first, you know. Uh, but you know, do you abide by local laws? And I think it's a Thailand. You cannot insult or say anything derogatory about uh, the monarchy. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, like, do you abide by that law? You know, then you're going to have some special checks in your AI that when used there, it will not say anything inappropriate, you know, about that. You know, China has similar things. There's mm. going to be many different, different places that have different uh, things. And then there's going to be things that are maybe less uh, inflammatory that will be like, okay, maybe we're okay with this. And we've seen this again and again in the social media space, how they do content moderation, how they do recommendation algorithms. It's been an abject failure, in my view, the lack of transparency and access for people to study that. We end up relying on whistleblowers or, art, you know, investigative journalists that come out with articles about how in certain, you know, historical geopolitical conflicts, Facebook has chosen to do things in the favor of one side or not the other that look awful, but we only find out it, you know, six months or a year later when someone on the ground actually, you know, found it out because we don't have the tools for people to go and like check this regularly. Um AI and, is, and, yeah, go ahead. And even worse, the, like some story like that breaks and then all of a sudden you have, uh, it's almost like you can't speak ill about the monarchy, but like th things that are, uh, that paint a difficult picture around social media often get throttled in social media. Pop, mm -hmm. you know? So then there's like, it creates this really difficult problem of um, there's no avenue. And I think this is like getting to the point of like uh, your research and it's trying to create those avenues for um let's say, citizens of the global internet world to be able to um, um, express engage. their... Yeah, engage. Yeah. Like, participate, maybe, is yeah. like, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the creation of the system, which is essentially the hive mind that we're all a part of that, uh, to whatever degree we want to or not, affects our perception of the world, right? Like, we are bound by the first 10 results on a Google search, mm -hmm. and we're bound by what we see on TV and what we find in libraries, and that's what we think is true. But like there's and and I think to the for the most part we could say it has been true, um, but also when the um, when these things are way more arcane and they're not like humans building them, then I think that mm -hmm. there's like a whole other can of worms there to explore. Mm -hmm. 
But anyway, that was the the beginning side uh, side digression before we talked about uh, something that I think that you're very interested in that I'm excited to learn more about. That is consent on the web. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't you give us a little primer and like we can riff off of that? Yeah, sure. Um, so right now, the web is governed by this file called the robots.txt file. So thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of websites have this file. You can go to it right now, newyorktimes.com slash robots.txt. And it's the one file on the web that's guaranteed to be readable by any machine. Because it's the instruction file for every web domain, New York Times, YouTube, uh, archives, GitHub, Reddit, whatever you want it to be. Um, that will tell you or tell a machine which parts of the website um, they the, the website gives consent for those crawlers to crawl. So, and these crawlers are the things that Google uses, AI companies use, web archives use. Anybody that wants to read the web or index the web, um, they sort of jump from website to website and they take a snapshot of what they see on each web page, uh, copy it essentially. And um, the robots.txt file tells you what parts of the websites they consent for you to look at, which parts they don't consent for you to look at. And it's structured by, they, they say specific agents can do this, specific agents can't, specific, or, or they can say the, the star agent wildcard, everybody can, everybody can't. Um, and agents, there might be like the Google search you know, agent. There's going to be the Google Extended, which is Google's AI agent for Gemini empowering their AI products. There is GPT Bot, which is OpenAI's agent, and there, there are you know hundreds of, of thousands of agents. And so this file tells people what's consenting, it's not. Pre AI world um, or modern AI world, I should say, um, most of the crawlers are uh, for web search so it's google or bing or whatever you know mapping the web so they can send you to the right web pages when you ask for you know best sushi in boston um and although there's no legal requirement that any company adhere to the restrictions or recommendations of these robots at txt most big companies adhere to them they say, you know what, fine, we'll, we'll do exactly what you say because you want your content to be indexed by the web because you want when people search for, for you to actually be able to go there. Um, but similarly, if we stop respecting it, some websites that are angry that you're going to places they don't want you to see, uh, like maybe stuff behind paywalls or private content or something like that, they will, um, they will like build in anti-circumvention measures for crawlers, which are things that make it like send crawlers in infinite loops, you know, make them get lost, you know, make them copy bad material. Like there's all these like things that, that the web, some people do, but very few do um, to try to stop crawling. But because there's this best practice in place for companies like, you know, we'll respect it. And people are like, okay, great. We won't build these things. We have sort of a somewhat healthy ecosystem on the web. Okay, that's the backstory. Any questions before we go into like the new age stuff or I think we should cover that? Well, there's a couple of notes, really. And I think it's like it's it's really cool that there's this convention that emerged out of essentially the Google crawler um, that has reached a level of maturity and technical sophistication um, that is honestly kind of incredible. Like that there's mm -hmm. this, this hidden language to the Internet around. Yeah. Well, the whole world of of of. Uh, um, website indexing and ranking and SEO stuff, I think is really interesting. Um, and it does provide like this illusion of relevancy. And it really is based on these like, um, let's call them tags that you add on to a website that for a person who isn't technically inclined, there's a mm -hmm. bunch of those. There's a whole bunch of like SEO keywords, JSON LD type stuff to make, to help structure, uh, to help the crawler 
know what's in the page a bit more easily. Uh, there's robot uh, robots.txt. And there's some kind of dialogue where there's like there's asymmetry in power and relevance, but there's like a discussion going on around uh, the permissiveness of certain data. You know, this is mm -hmm. this is to be found. Uh, I think one of the most interesting things uh, that happened in uh, the history of the internet was when Facebook decided to be very aggressive about not allowing Google to crawl um, like Facebook profiles and things yeah. like that. And, and so it forced users to go to the Facebook platform to then search for their friends. Mm -hmm. And I think to, in no large, in no small degree, that was a, 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 a lever that Facebook used to gain such a, such a gigantic user base. Um, we see that happening with like a very different strategy with Reddit, very different strategy with other, uh, like Bora or, or other kinds yeah. of platforms. Um, and, and it's interesting to see that dynamic play out in like the global landscape. Mm -hmm. But it also is kind of weird that it just, it's a uh, convention. It's not enforced and there's no enforceability. Um, so what does the new world hold, hold for us? Good question. Um, I agree. This whole language is just, fascinating but um i'll give some quick background quickly on um so who are we the data province initiative is a voluntary uh research collaboration collective of people we span like 15 to 20 countries over the last year and a half we're just people that are passionate about auditing data and the web um and this project was an audit of the robots.txt um, and terms of service to understand the layer beneath data sets, what pre training data sets to like, where does it all come from? What's the origin? Um, and how is that origin or the data commons, as we're calling it, shifting? And what we found, the headlines are that um, the robots.txt are rapidly changing. In mid 2023, there was a huge spike whereby um, a set of the main AI companies or crawlers um, were dramatically disallowed from any crawling across thousands of websites. And so the spike now spans, I think, like um, at the middle of 2023, the amount of data that uh, in, common, in C4, which is a very popular uh, data, pre-training data set, was less than one percent less than one percent of it was disallowed from being used according to robots of txt less than a year later it's now almost six percent so like a huge portion of the data is suddenly being said you're no longer allowed to use this if you are common crawl open ai google anthropic cohere uh or any of those and if you look at the top websites, so those are mainly news, periodicals, social media, forums, blogs, things like that. So the, the 2000 most well-maintained, critical, and largest sources of data, the percent something like a quarter or almost 30%. And so like nearly a third of the data, the, the, the best, highest quality, most refreshed, um, most well curated, most trustworthy websites are suddenly um, revoking consent. And so this is sort of a turning point, not just for AI companies, but also because the way the consent's being revoked, it's very binary. So they're revoking it for anybody that, including web archives like Common Crawl, that respect these robots at TXT and have had tens of thousands of academic, sociological, anthropological articles written on them uh, in you know, common literature. They are essentially our ability to stud, study the history of the web and what's going on. And, and they're primarily not for training AI, though people use it for that. And so um, not only is consent being revoked from AI companies, but also for non-commercial uses and for academic and research users and, and web archives and things like that. And so the openness of the data commons for many different uses is, is essentially retracting um, in a very quick way that could have long-standing consequences. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> There's other headlines, but yeah. Well, I think, well, where to even begin? I mean, like, I think that there's, I, I think this goes back to our conversation about copyright and, um, and um, copyright holders. Um, 
doing what they would naturally do, which is use every lever at their disposal to capitalize on their um, licenses as much as possible, right? So mm -hmm. this probably means that they won't allow OpenAI to uh, easily crawl the web, but if they open AI reaches out to them and wants to find a deal, they'll probably arrive at some kind of monetary agreement where they will license their trading data for AI exactly. for some kind of uh, for some kind of deal, right? Um, but there's I I have a lot of feelings around this because I think that there's mm -hmm. a there's a <laughs> not just you. <laughs> there's a yeah. sadness. There's a sadness around the instinct toward closing things, and like every everybody falls back to their trenches, and um, but I also understand it. I completely understand the fact that like if you look back at the history of um, how information distributing entities uh, are able to amass a coercive power let's call it, mm -hmm. um, then of course you'd be very wary of uh, of an entity that is building this thing that could essentially like uh, completely upend your your functioning in society. Yeah. This has already happened though with like I think news and journalism. Um, I think that there's like, there's this deeper crisis around the business model of, of journalism Mm -hmm. That has not been fixed by the web. If anything, it's been made probably way worse with the mm -hmm. clickbaity nature of things and a lot of the, you know, sort of amplified political uh, polarization mm -hmm. where there's a complete uh, abdication of these journalistic um, uh, entities to report on the truth. The truth is kind of like the condiment to the, this way more, you know, uh, Let's call it limbic system engaging analogy. Wow! Oh, you're firing all cylinders here. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. <laughs> Should be a writer. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> um, so I have a lot of feelings, and but I don't know exactly where I land because I think that like, um, mm -hmm. well, and there's also the fact that as you mentioned, these things aren't necessarily enforceable. So if you have a uh, um, uh, an agent that doesn't care about robots, TXT, they'll be able to use the data anyway. Right, and, uh, unless they run into maybe what this means is that some of the sophistication around the robots TXT warfare, where uh, you know these uh, mechanisms to have them go into infinite loops or to crash or to hack into you know get root access into the crawler. Now I'm having to now I'm just having a good time. Um, okay. Then, uh, yeah, I think I think I like to believe in a world where the best information is spread the fastest. Uh, and the most widely, and that um, that it affects people for the better. That is not the world that we live in, but I think that we have a chance in the project that we're in, you know we're all sort of working mm -hmm. toward to, to to at least inch toward that objective. And I don't know whether this this discovery that you've made seems to be pointing in that direction or not. Um, but that's my little two cents on it. Like what a you're you've you've sat with this for for longer now and like you're you're planning a whole uh pr push around it uh what do, what is the what what are your digested thoughts on it yeah i mean the pr push is is happening whether we want want it to or not so what we're trying to do is maybe help push the narrative in a in a more useful direction um and i love that you said you don't know where you you sit with it quite yet. And that is the response we want. That is a great response because as you can tell, and you've noted, this is a nuanced issue. Uh, it it hurts a little bit when people fall squarely on one side or the other and they're like, AI is getting what's coming to them. The web should be entirely opt-in consent, like for every last piece of information, all data is the same uh, and let's take down AI. I, I, there's a lot of nuance missing there and there's, uh, there's also it's a, it's it's a tragedy for the web archives for the academics for journalism about the web, but then there's people on the other side that are you know uh, screw the consent um, and you know I don't think that that's healthy at all either. A lot of consent really matters, as you said, to journalism, to co you know heavily copyrighted and and commercial industries. You know you're an author of a of a sci-fi book like you surely if you are you know commercializing that have some rights to to how your you know, content's used. Um, and so the, the truth is that there are many stakeholders here, not just commercial AI and creators. 
And we need to find a protocol that allows, and this is one thing we're pushing for, maybe a new robots.txt that has some nuance. What if they could say, not for commercial AI use, or not for AI use at all, but we allow other things. Or, you know, as long as you don't compete with us, you know, uh, th like things that people are actually saying in their terms of service, rather than, um, you know, these sort of blanket um, permissions that people are scrambling to do and for fear of how their data is being used, or for just the desire to commoditize it. And both cases exist. I think there are people that are more sympathetic to in how they're trying to control their data and others that maybe we're less sympathetic to because they're just trying to look to, you know, to make money when in a new way that, you know, wasn't the, the initial intended use of their data anyway, um, or they don't necessarily, they aren't the copyright holder of the data or they, or something like that. It's, it's nuanced. And so the world that I want to live in is where everybody is able to um, express their consent in a fine grain way. And then we have smarter people than us, you know, the lawyers, the, the ethicists, figure out the best practices between what consent mechanisms should and in what cases should they be adhered to or enforced and what cases maybe things should be fair use. And I think that there's a spectrum there and the details really matter. Um, so maybe the top news websites do end up licensing all their data. Um, and because, you know, rather than it being, you know, used uh, commercially, and I think that'd be good, but we also fear a world where only a couple of players that can afford that data are the ones that can monopolize the, the AI conversation, or at least the forefront of it. Um, so I'm particularly apprehensive of exclusive contracts um, mm -hmm. as just a sort of principle of where we want things to go. Um, but I'm coming from the perspective of an academic, you know, pro-open researcher that likes transparency and openness and thinks the world will, will go in a better place because of that. There's, I mean, I, I think that, um, I think if we had a, a format to express this consent, um, I think that would be awesome, even just to get the expression on paper. You know, like there's a, there's yeah. a document that outlines this exactly. is what the intent of this is. Um, and, but then, and like, it doesn't really... And like there's still layers of 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 stuff to build on top that are uh, it's still very difficult to enforce because you don't really know you don't really see your exact data unless you're very you know like unless you're very lucky uh, on the on the on the flip side of of a of an LLM right like if you ask an LLM to um, recite Romeo and Juliet word for word. Um, the odds that you're going to get it exactly right, I think, are actually pretty slim. Uh, and, and so, I don't know. And then I think copyright is this really interesting thing because we were really not prepared for the internet's ability to widely distribute information so easily and so cheaply, and you know, cheaper and more easily every every business quarter, and. But a lot of these copyright systems are built on to protect the interests of the copyright holders, which are not necessarily the interests of the inventors or the creators or the people who actually made this stuff. Mm. So that's I get a little frustrated with like the Lion uh, lawsuit or the the Universal leaving TikTok or the all, all these kinds of uh, things where the PR face of it is to protect artists. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is to protect the studios. It's not yeah, like the artists have already sold right. their rights and like they don't own the the future revenues for new kinds of things. And so um so I think there's like a little there's I get frustrated at that version of copyright enforcement. And mm -hmm. I think that like but that's the kind of version that is very lucrative and that is very has been wielded to enforce control over the spread of information very effectively. Yeah. Um and I come up for, at it from a very different perspective. So I mentioned that like the highest leverage when I thought when I wrote the book, the thing that motivated me was like the highest leverage thing I could do was to be included in the data set for for these LLMs. Not because I want the LLM to plagiarize me or I want the LLM to, uh, th uh, you know, but because if I if I'm telling a story that is going to affect a being, and 
you know, if it can affect, it affected me for sure being the author of it, but and it affected the people who've read it so far, which is a giant blessing. But if it can affect the being, like this thing that can, uh, you know, like all of a sudden make determinations around, that will make determinations around things we can't even imagine now, then sort of like, please train on my data, please go for it. And now, if I could add some safeguards, but don't tell anybody, like, you don't need to be sharing this, you know, like widely, or if you do charge them and pay me some royalties, you know, like that kind Easy. of stuff. Um, then, then I do think that's really interesting, but also very hard to enforce. Um, so what are your thoughts on the enforceability of these, of these consent mechanisms? I mean, I think that's entirely going to be, uh, come down to the law and that's going to vary by jurisdiction. I mean, unless you mean enforceability by like built-in anti-circumvention warfare, um, people could take it in their own hands. You know, WordPress and uh, Squarespace, others like they can, they have a large set of websites that they have, you know, control over and they can build tools, you know, for thousands mm -hmm. of websites that sort of generalize or people can, you know, build that into like, you know, the, the host or something. Um, but I, yeah, I guess there's people taking it in their own hands or, but, but here's the thing, like the AI companies say that they respect the robots at TXT, the major ones do, but then they're being caught in some cases, like recently perplexity was found circumventing them according to Wired. But there's the nuance here is they're not, uh, this is, I suspect this, I don't have proof, but that they are not circumventing it for training data, but they're circumventing it for inference time. When people like say, oh, tell me about the latest this, and then they go in. Now, this was meant to be the panacea because people could say, oh, but at inference time, you can actually pull an article and attribute it. Whereas if you just trained on it, you don't know whether that article or another article was the one that generated the thing. So this was meant to be the ability to give credit, give attribution, maybe even compensate. And so there's, there's some really interesting questions that, uh, that are going to come up here. This has been awesome. I'm glad that we still have more things to talk about. So you're welcome on the show anytime. Uh, let's keep chatting. Yeah, I appreciate it. And if, if when, after we release it, you have like a couple burning questions, we can do those. I'll put on the same shirt and then we can. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Sounds great. All right, man. Uh, thank you so much for the time. This was a great. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Really enjoyed the conversation. Good All to right. see you again. You too, man. Take it easy. Take it easy. Bye.